All right, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the David A. Pettis podcast. Today, my guest is Lisa Perea, a rock star with a unique story about how she got into the tax industry. I promise you, it's going to be shocking. It's going to be vulgar. But more importantly, it's going to be super exciting. She is a rock star in this industry, and I want you to get to meet her. So well, let's welcome Lisa. <laughs> So welcome, Lisa. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Awesome, Lisa. So, um, you know, I've heard a lot about you. I've seen you in action. You're doing some big things in the world. So tell everybody, what is it that you do today? A lot. <laughs> well, I let's do narrow a lot it down. And I wish I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> let's narrow um, it down. We, we do a little bit of, well, in our office, we are ba- basically a one-stop shop. We started off in taxes uh, over 12 years ago and have evolved into adding other complementary services. So we do credit, uh, business services, business taxes, home loans, business credit, business loans, anything financial, we kind of have our, our, our finger in the wow. pulse of that. How, how did this all start for you? Like, where did you start off that got you to this point? <laughs> so I was actually going to college. I wanted to be a CPA. Um, originally, I was going to be a chef, but chefs don't make that much money. And, um, I had a little boy at the time was single mom. And so my, I was always good with numbers, really loved it. And so I changed majors to accounting and I thought, okay, I'm going to be a CPA and, you know, have this grandiose idea of working for Pricewaterhouse and all this other stuff. Fast forward to nearly graduating, got an internship at one of the big five and I hated it. And I was also bartending through college. I hated being in the office. I hated that it wasn't fun. Um, It wasn't sexy. It was boring. It was a very boring thing. And I was a glorified coffee maker. Um, And I I hated it. So I quit. And I just started doing taxes for my friends and family and everybody in the industry because I was still bartending. And in some weird idea, I was like, you know what? I can do this on my own. I already had like 100 clients. I was like, I should start a brick and mortar at some point. Um, and I actually started, believe it or not, in the strip clubs. I was doing taxes with a laptop I, and yeah, I was doing taxes. I was, in the dressing I was rooms. not expecting us to go there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Like, okay. well, I, I told you I was bartending and I bartended at a strip club and I also bartended at some of the major clubs all over Florida. Um, At one point I was in South Florida and then, you know, I would go and make a lot of money. I mean, there's a lot of money in bartending and I got into hosting and I started um, marketing like private parties and things like that. And like, you know, the Island parties and stuff like that in Florida are really, really popular. So I was like the it party girl in like the early 2000s. And if you wanted to have like a really nice high end party, like I knew how to organize it, put all the people together. I knew all the hottest DJs. I did taxes for everybody at iHeartRadio. Um, so I can put something really quickly together. And a lot of the girls that were working, they're like, hey, you know, my mom claims my kids and I have like five or six kids and I don't work on the books. And so they were giving them like a thousand dollars per kid. And I'm like, let me show you how you can turn this into a business and buy a house and buy a car. And I just started educating them. And they're like, hey, you know, I can't come during the day to your office but you can come to my office, technically my office. And I was like, sure. You know, I, I was working in that lifestyle. So I was like, I don't care. I'll make money. My kids are sleeping. Why not make money if I'm already awake and I'm working? So I would work and bartend. As soon as I got out of my job, I'd have my portable, you know, little $49 Canon printer from Walmart and a laptop that I bought from pawn shop. And I was doing taxes in the, in the dressing room of, of strip clubs. And they were paying me like $1,200 just to go see them cash. I was like, what? And they're like, and oh yeah. My were they in ones though? Club. Was it in ones? Was it in ones? Uh, oh yeah. Ones and fives. <laughs> 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 oh my God. Yeah. It was so funny. Cause uh, my banker, um, he finally got the courage like, Hey Lisa, are you a, uh, you know, do you dance? Like what club do you dance at? I'm like, no <laughs> honey, I do, I do their taxes and they pay me in cash. So, you know, like, and, yeah, and sure. He, 
yeah. and they didn't care about the price. You know, I was, I was going to them, servicing them and giving them education. I was charging $1,200, $1,500 a pop. And you do six or seven girls in one dressing room because the minute that you do one and they're like, oh, my God, I haven't done my taxes. Can you do them real quick? Hey, call your mom, send pictures of the IDs, everything like I was just I was just on it. Like I'm a hustler. So I was just on it. And I would make seven or eight grand in a night. And I was like, <laughs> you're this taking is all the strippers money. <laughs> oh, I'll take any money. <laughs> Oh my God. So, oh, so, so this is funny because um, I used to be in the bar business pretty heavily. I owned a bar mm -hmm. for a long time. And um, the reason this correlates to me is because I remember when I got into the tax industry, I remember reading case studies and like kind of like outrageous case studies and things that would like pass for deductions. And one of the case studies was on a, a, a female dancer who got breast augmentation when she got breast implants and yep. she put that on her put tax return deduction. were you the were you the preparer uh <laughs> i was one of in that case study to be honest with you I, I did get um i did get notified because it it is ordinary yes and necessary it, and it is ordinary and necessary so they, so they we were able to get it as a deduction yes yeah 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 and they went to the irs court and they won mm -hmm. Um, which yep. is pretty interesting. Um, and then the second thing that made me think about this, and I had totally forgot, but I remember, I think it was my first or second year, this, this, this young lady comes into our office and I can tell that she's probably a dancer just to be truthful. Mm -hmm. Cause I could tell you, you just, they have a personality about them. They have a way they carry yeah. themselves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so she comes in and she's like, I need to file my taxes. And I was the only one in the office. It was like a Sunday. And I said, um, yeah, how can I help you? And then she says, oh yeah, I want to bring you all my receipts. And um, she had like a log book and she brought it out and she started showing me all her stuff. And I was like, what do you do? And she's like, oh, I'm a, I'm a dancer. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why are you like, how are you so organized? She's like, oh, this is my business, honey. And I was oh, like, yeah. damn girl. I was like, this it is, is cool. a huge business. One of my biggest clients is a multimillionaire and she wins all of the competitions in Vegas. <laughs> um, she actually got hired by Hustler as one of the consultants, like the movie with JLo. Oh, she was wow. As one of the consultants got paid a lot of money for that. She has a pole dancing company where she teaches like the actual mechanics of it. I went to one of the classes and it kicked my butt. I was so <laughs> tired. I had bruises everywhere. I was like, I don't know how you do this girl. I would yeah. rather you pay me to do your taxes than be up there dancing. That's I can't right. Do it. That's it, right. It's, well, it's, it's not for the weary. I'll tell you that much. Well, I wasn't expecting to hear this is how you started, but this is very <laughs> interesting to me because to be truth, truthful, we all start somewhere and that's pretty interesting. And so how did it evolve from there? Like you said, okay, I want to open my own business. I'm tired of going to these places or uh, did you? Well, like I still, to be honest with you, the first five years of my business, I really did. Like I was still bartending, even though I was done with school. Um, but I spent the first five years of my business, like learning my craft, being the best, learning how to market, learning sales because everything we do is all sales like it, it's not just hey i opened up my business and people are going to walk in i learned that the hard way the first season and therefore i was doing what i was doing yeah. but um it was just learning it was a big learning curve because it wasn't anything i learned in school and i i mean i have my my um graduate degree in and in, <laughs> in finance and not once was i taught how to do relationship marketing you know, how to follow up, how to create relationships, how to create a buzz in, in, in your area. I didn't know any of that, that I had to learn that. So the first five years, I really reinvested everything that I, I made in the business back into the business. I was still bar, uh, bartending and it got to a point where like, I was like, okay, I need to get to the next level. What do I need to do to get to the next level? And I really had to let go of the bartending and have that safety net of money to really put 100% into my tax business. So, so just kind of like, kind of for the reader, I mean, for the reader, for the listeners here today, like you're saying basically that you decided one day that it, it, I had to give up one thing to go for a bigger thing, which was go into, you know, the business and give up something that was bringing you cash. I mean, which most entrepreneurs have to go through. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the second thing I heard here, because 
I think a lot of I think a lot of tax business owners or business owners in general think they have to be like the best or know everything about before they get into a business, right? Like they have to oh, no. they gotta be a CPA or an EA or they they get scared because I, I hear this from a lot of people. Let's say they they start doing like you did, you started doing for friends and family, people you knew, mm -hmm. and then like they're like, Well, I want to open my own business, but what if somebody comes in and they have a return that I don't know how to do? And so like, I don't want to do that. I'm just going to work for somebody forever. Like, how did you overcome that? Because I think that's probably one of the biggest hiccups that most people go into. How did you overcome that? I never overcame it. I still don't. There's still stuff that walks through the door that I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and it's like, my answer, even to my preparers, and I have a lot of preparers that work underneath me and I train them and I try to give them all the knowledge that I have. But the answer in the office is yes, we'll figure it out later. There you go. Well, that, the answer is always yes. I mean, that I learned in bartending. That's not something that you naturally have. That's something that you have to learn. In bartending, that somebody will come up there and say, I want an XYZ drink. The answer is always going to be yes. You're not going to tell them, no, I don't know how to make that drink. So you have to Google it behind the bar. Absolutely, you know, absolutely minded. Drop all your napkins so you can just go and grab your phones. Like, what's XYZ drink, a recipe? Um, you know, or just say, Hey, do you know what's in it? Or, you know, you, you have to have that hustle. Like I'm not, you know, in the beginning I did accept every type of tax return that walked through the door because I was just trying to make money until I could figure out what I actually wanted to do. Now I can say, yeah, you know, I don't do that, but so-and-so in my office specializes in that. So let team. me put you onto my team. Whereas when I was a solopreneur, I had to say yes to everything, but the answer was always yes. And then it's like Google, IRS, what <laughs> that's, <laughs> figuring that's... out the forms, reading everything, and even like postponing it. I would let them know, like, hey, let's, you know, this is the process. We'll have a one on one. Let me figure out, you know, what your situation is so we can best give you the best option and kind of give them, give myself time to know their situation research it and come back two or three days later to give them really good service. That, that's so true, by the way. I mean, I, that's exactly what I would do. And I didn't know something I just Google it or read most of the answers to be truthful is you just read the damn form. Exactly. I mean, it, it's like get number from this form and divide it by this, or if you and qualify, the software here, makes is, it so easy to, well, you know, you can just go into the software. You know, Interesting, interesting enough. I mean, when I started, uh, you know, about 15 years ago, the software wasn't like really detailed in the way that it explained no. things. But today, I mean, it'll tell you if they qualify so easy. I mean, I hate to say that to people, though, because that takes a lot of credibility of our knowledge away, right? Like saying, hey, the software does it all. But when I when I train my new team members, I always think that like, hey, guys, just so you know, I mean, if you have a question, the software gives you this little button and you just click on it and it tells you what it's supposed to mean, you know, like, well, don't I mean, be it, it shouldn't take away from the credibility because it's the same thing as going onto the IRS website and finding the form and the instructions to that form. You know, I'm, I'm glad that the software has caught up with the times and has made it more easier for us yeah. to generate more revenue. But you still have to kind of know what you're looking for. If you don't know how to ask the right question, you're not going to get the right answer. That That's correct. So so you went from being, you know, on the go, started a brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. And today, kind of tell us where you're at. I know you said you do a lot of services. How many customers do you guys serve? So in our tax office, we serve about 1,500. We have one brick and mortar in um, Florida. We just opened up this one here in Dallas. Um, and then we have like during tax season, I have little satellite offices for preparers that work out of the office. So one is in Louisiana, in New Orleans. We have another one in Ocala. Um, we have two in Orlando area and then one in South Florida. So what we do is during the tax season for those that want to see an actual tax preparer face to face, those that are in that area just go to like a Regis office and they see them. But so, we, because of the pandemic, we were able to really go 100% virtual. So I don't well, really that, need as many brick and mortars. That's where I was going to go with. So you're saying <laughs> you're trying to go virtual with everybody. What's the percentage of your business today that's virtual? 99. 99%. It's very rare that somebody walks into the office. That's more of our older generation. And that's in our Tampa office because that's the one I've had the longest. So in our Tampa office, anybody that doesn't have access to the internet can go in there if they want to print a paperwork out, if they need help with translation, 
um, just because we're in a predominantly Spanish area that has older, um, yep. you know, retirees that we do taxes for just locally because they walk in to the office um, that those that we'll see face to face because they're just not up on the, you know, all the but, new yeah. devices and how to connect and things like that. But for primarily it's 99% we were able to pivot and go virtual. That's really cool because I think, by the way, I think that is a, like a, a goal for most, I mean, most pro professional services today, I would imagine all lawyers, engineers, accountants, everybody wants to go virtual. I mean, I know mm -hmm. there's the, there's a lot of uh, merit behind the face to face, right? I get that. I, I think that the advantage personally for me is that we can kind of do business pretty quickly. We can take care of problems in a faster pace this way. It gives us flexibility oh, of time. Um, and, and your case, cause I mean, we, I know we've talked before. One of the things that I think is most beautiful about what you said is that you relocated in the last year, right? It was in a year or a year or so. Yeah. It's and, been nine months. Actually, we've been here in, in, for nine months. And he, that gave you the freedom to do that. And so I know, yeah. um, I know you got into other businesses when you moved to Dallas. So tell us about some of those businesses that you're in now. So our headquarters here actually does training for tax preparers. So we have a training and coaching program that teaches them the sales aspect of it and helps them create offers and how to sell it, how to pitch it and how to teach their team how to pitch as well. So wow. our office here is actually twice as big as my Tampa office. But we do also uh, credit repair seminars where we have people that want to repair their own credit and they're kind of afraid to use another company. They'll come in for a day and my husband, who is my credit specialist, will do the whole training class. Um, and then, like I said, I train other uh, tax preparers that want to get into the business, how to set up their company in, in a way and themselves because it doesn't they could be a solopreneur but how to set themselves up for success so that they can learn how to sell, um, how to sell themselves, how to create a pitch for themselves and how they um, introduce themselves to other people when they're networking and just really building their confidence in their first two years of business, because that's when you're new to the industry. And that's when most tax preparers quit. You know, yep. they're like, oh, this is a hu side hustle. I made a little bit of money and I'm done. And they don't really see the potential that, this can be a seven figure business Heck if you yeah. really do it the right way. Heck yeah. I think, I think you have the right idea. I mean, there's so many people that I meet in this industry that are just, they're, they're a little, they're a tweak away from blowing up, but they just haven't figured out that, that a lot of, I think the biggest challenge is most of them think that it's a sale, it's a service business and it's really a sales business. Mm -hmm. um, and so they think that whatever comes in, that's what they do. They service that, but it's truly, you got to go out and you got to get the customers. You got to build them in, bring them in and do the, you know, the process is about getting new customers. I tell people all the time, if you don't do get new customers, I mean, you're dying. You have to get new customers every year. Even if, even if you had hundred percent retention, you need to add because people will leave you. People will die. People will relocate. In this case, you're virtual. Or they so retire and don't do taxes anymore. I mean, I've had clients for 15 years and now I'm, I'm seeing their kids and their kids are having kids and, <laughs> And it, it's really nice, but then they're retiring. So they're aging out, you know, and they're like, oh, I'm done. I, I really don't have, <laughs> you know, a retirement set up. My kids are taking care of me now. I don't got to do taxes. So you always have to, you know, go out there and get new client, you know, client acquisition is super important and client retention is just as important, but you have to keep marketing yourself, That's you know, true. as this as we become more virtual, there's a huge competition virtually as well. There's always going to be competition no matter what. So you always have to market yourself and you have to kind of target yourself a little bit differently than everybody else. Who, who, who wins in competition today now? Like, like how does somebody win and dominate now? I mean, is it possible to dominate this area or this market? Is there like a thing I mean, you can do? This, you have to pick where you want to dominate. You can't dominate everything. Because most people, even myself, I don't have the ad spend that H&R Block has or Liberty Tax or, you know, anything like that. I mean, look at Tim Robbins and, and I'm not saying we're in direct competition with them, but these are big companies that have billions of dollars in ad spend. So the way that you dominate, at least for me, was becoming really good at something within the whole spectrum of the tax industry niching down and being the best at that 
So in our whole organization, we target and, and our target market is small businesses and in, independent contractors there you go. that make less than a million dollars a year. So it's very niche. And I can even niche down more than that because last year we went after the health insurance agents and health insurance industry. They are all 1099 workers. Um, and we were able to kind of help them save money on taxes, teach them how to register a business, how to use a business to uh, leverage that on tax saving strategies and so on and so forth. And we created this offer for them that will help them grow their business within the health industry. And that allowed us to work smarter, not harder, and ha actually service less clients at a higher tech, uh, ticket price. Heck yeah. So ba basically the advice, uh, and, and so everybody gets this, she's saying, hey, focus on something that you can do be very good at, because if you try to be good at everything, which we, we did at the beginning, right? I was there too. Yeah, we, we every, everyone does. I did too. I did too. <laughs> you have to start somewhere so that you know what you want to do and what you want to be good at. I mean, yeah. I, I hate doing taxes for certain industries. I really do. Some yeah. certain industries are more disorganized than others. And some of them are just not, you can't charge enough. Like, you know, no offense, but EIC clients, you can only charge, charge a certain amount <laughs> because they will jump from tax prepared to tax prepared to get the cheapest rate and the highest refund. And there's no loyalty. You can't, the client retention is a little bit differently. So at the beginning, yeah, everybody's going to take everything that walks through the door. You got to make money to pay the bills. But once you're in, a, in the industry and you kind of know where you want to go, you might want to only do taxes for nail artists, you know, and nail salons. And you get really, really good at it. And you really understand the industry and you really understand where it's going from. People are going to start knowing like, hey, that's the lady for, for nails. That's the tax lady for nails. You need to go see her because she hooked me up and she knows everything about our industry. You don't have to explain anything to her. She just gets it. And you, you can start becoming that tax lady for nails, you know, or, you know, whatever you want to do, but eventually you, you got to get into something because not all, all money's good money. No, no, it's not. Some of the, you're right. So there's a lot of people out there that are doing tax returns for people that are just not the right client, but we got to go through it to learn. You got to, you got to go through some shit to learn some shit, right? Hell yeah, you, <laughs> definitely. I've had some clients. Ooh, I can tell you I've had some clients. You know, it's yeah. funny that you, you just said that I, I got to, so there, I've been putting a lot of content about tax stuff lately and I get messages daily from people. And there's, there's one guy who's really just been messaging me like, Hey man, uh, you know, questions. And I'm just like, yeah, let's get you on the calendar. And then he's like, Oh, you're too busy for me, man. Like, like, and I'm just like, this is exactly the type of customer I don't want in my life. <laughs> like somebody who's already, I'm not, they haven't even given me a dollar and they're already yelling at me. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't. There's certain, there's certain things that, you know, I have my staff trained as to who I'm willing to take and who I'm not. If they can't be, you know, I, and I have certain boundaries. I have six kids. So no, on, a, on even in August, that. I do not want to do taxes at eight o'clock at night. That's not happening. Yeah. So if you can't conform to my hours of operation and take a lunch break and make priority for your taxes, you're not going to see me. You're going to see one of my teammates. And, but nobody wants to work at eight o'clock on August 3rd. Like that's but crazy. No, they don't. I, I don't even want somebody like that. So not, that's why I tell people not all money is good money. If you need it in the beginning, by all means, but start, you know, being picky and choosy as to what you want to do and Ooh. make sure that it's something you can scale because, yeah. you know, doing taxes for $300 a pop, $150 a pop, you can't scale that. You're going to kill yourself working. But if you're doing something or a package where it includes tax services, as an add-on bonus to everything else that you do, and you're charging somebody fifteen hundred dollars, you only need three or four hundred clients to get half a million dollars. Heck yeah, that's where the money's at. I always tell people charge more, do less. <laughs> yes, definitely charge more so, and do less. So I you agree. said one thing I want to talk on before we end today. I, I do. I mean, I know you mentioned it briefly there. You have children, so tell us how does somebody um, that is being that that is becoming you know, very, very well, who's already successful, but now working into the the growth of your your path is to to help now the next generation of tax professionals because that wasn't it mm -hmm. before. Now it is. You're becoming more of a teacher. You're helping people grow. 
how do you manage all of this and still have time for, you said six kids? Six. Yes. So I, once I let go of the bartending in my head was the goal to make sure that I'm not building a business to build a life. I'm building my life around my business. So what that means to me is I have certain business hours and there's days that I work and my kids understand that. But when I'm present with my kids, I'm present. And every week I have a conversation with my assistant and we go over my schedule and what my kids needs are. And that gets blocked off first. So my kids, my family gets blocked off first. Then you know, my own personal training, personal development gets blocked off sec- third. And then, you know, my coaching clients or my mentees, or, you know, if, if I have certain blocks of time where people can kind of jump into a Zoom call and ask tax questions about their tax office or whatever, those get blocked off. And I email them like, hey, this is your available Zoom time to kind of jump in. Anything that's available, there's certain days that I do taxes, there's certain days that I do credit, and there's certain days that I do home loans. So- wow everything's very, very scheduled. I don't see anybody without an appointment. Even my phone calls are scheduled. Um, it's not that I have free time because I do, but it's blocked off. It's scheduled free time, scheduled free right. time. I go to the gym three times a week. Like, you know, a lot of people are like, oh my God, how do you do that? If you put priority for what you want to do and there's these hard boundaries for people, like you cannot jump into that time because that time is allotted for this there's a lot more you can do with your day if you're more scheduled and disciplined that's right so what i heard is nobody should have excuses you got six kids and a multi-million dollar business (laughs) (laughs) no none at all yeah i i hear it all the time people make excuses why they can't make money or they can't show up to the the job site or whatever it is i don't i don't believe that i think it's just poor management of time that's all it is priorities and time are big things for successful people i just just thinking outside the box either you know most people they have like they're having problems with critical thinking skills like okay this is the box i'm stuck in this problem how do i get out of it but i'm still stuck in this little fishbowl break the fishbowl yeah just get out of it and go do something else (laughs) you're violent i like it i like it you're violent (laughs) It, it, it has to be honestly um you know i i i don't always like to talk about certain aspects but i am brown skin, Latina. Um, English is not my first language. Sometimes that there's certain words that I get stuck on, but I'm also a woman business owner. There's a lot of doors that have been closed to me. There's a lot of, you know, rooms that uh, there's, you know, people in there rubbing elbows, multimillionaires and billionaires rubbing elbows that, you know, at to a certain point were closed off to me. So I had to figure out how to get through the window to get into that room. Because if I wasn't in that room, I wasn't going to make deals that I've made now. Um, You know, the biggest deal we've made to date is we're doing um, business taxes for a client that has over 25 companies, hasn't done taxes in three years. Oh, man. um, Has no bookkeeping in place. And we quoted him at $262,000. And they took it. To do all the work. And they took it. Oh, yeah. He was like, yeah, I'll take that. I'm like, would you like to pay me or would you like to pay Uncle Sam? Because yeah. when Uncle Sam comes knocking at your door, you're going to owe a lot of money. Heck yeah. A lot more than, you know, what I'm telling you. So I have to be able to be in those rooms, but I didn't meet him without meeting somebody else that kind of let me into that room to meet him. So yeah, you yeah. have to learn how to be gritty and not necessarily violent, but you have to be aggressive and assertive to get to those deals. And if you're not willing to put yourself out there, you're not going to get deals like that. You know, um, the the other deal that we just did was with uh, another health insurance company with MetLife. They're letting us into their um, sales team floors and via Zoom and doing a presentation. Um, The one that I just did last month was was in front of 150 people. And out of the 150 people, we retained 98 as clients. Wow. So you have to, you have to get over your fear. You have to think outside the box. You have to really break down all those barriers and go push past them. If you really want to take your business to the next level. Heck yeah. Wow. Guys, everybody, if you're listening or, or watching this, man, what she just shared with you is about being determined to be successful and you can't let anything hold you back. There is no excuse in business or in life to not get what you mm-hmm. want. It doesn't matter. Um, and that's, that's killer. Well, um, so Lisa, 
we've got to kind of kind of wind down. So can how can people get a hold of you, work with you if they wanted to get coaching by you or work with you? How can they get a hold of you? Just send me a text message. My number is 813-531-5812. Again, that number is 813-531-5812. Wow. Okay. I cool. hold that very close to me. It's always next to me. There you go. Well, we can put that in there and if we'll add also your Facebook and everything else below. So if there's anything that we can do to connect with, with you and anyone on our, our visitors, or I'm sorry, our, our, our viewers, I don't know why I'm thinking I'm at an office right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you got me all thinking about all kinds of stuff right now, I'm like, man, oh, I, have yeah. no I, I, I always gotta... get fired up when we're talking about business and oh, sales. Man. I mean, that's something that fires me up because, you know, superseding our sales goal every week and and just really knowing what your target is and trying to smash that target on a weekly basis it just gets me fired up and i like getting other people fired about 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 their own business and that's just like my passion now before it was like on my own business now i'm like i want you to win and i want you to win let's all win together you know Wow. Well, the passion that you're bringing, by the way, is so exciting. I know our viewers are going to be like, man, we got to connect with her. And I I'm telling you guys, I've met her in person. She is this excited about doing everything. And, uh, well, maybe not everything, (laughs) maybe not. And she's got a beautiful family. Her husband's amazing and he can help you with mortgage loans. Right. He's the guy. Yep. Yeah. And credit. He's my credit guru. You know, anytime I'm stuck on something with credit, I'm like, oh, what does this mean? And he knows all about it and how to fix all of that stuff. Well, any of our viewers need help. I promise you guys can go to her. I trust her. Uh, I, I really mean that. I give her an endorsement. Hi, hi, hi. Like thumbs up. She's amazing. So um, thank Lisa, you. thank you so much for being the guest today. And I look forward to having you again. Uh, we're going to yes. talk. We should probably talk. I'm going to say right before tax season so you could fire everybody up. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, Before tax season, even I I will say one thing in parting that most tax preparers take the summer off. This is your off season. This is when you should be training. This is when you should be getting, you know, building relationships and and really getting out there and getting the word out there, not just in your own community, but even your own online community and get in touch with people and just get in front of people so that when come tax season, you're the only choice that they start thinking about. They don't want to think about H&R Block or Liberty Tax or, you know, ABC Tax down the street because they've been speaking with you throughout the summer and asking you questions and you're just present in their everyday life. And, you know, maybe hit them up on Instagram or send a little DM or whatever. But this is when you really need to aggressively attack the market so that come tax season, it's a no brainer. They're already going to be doing business with you. Heck yeah. Well, good words to let us out on. And I really appreciate your time today. We're wishing you much success and look forward to having you back soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Miss Lisa.